kid me to fall to your row. Um, uh-huh. Um, a few housekeeping. Some people have already discovered the toilets here anyway. Uh, with toilets at the back, at the front here, behind me, and with toilets at the back. And just to let you know, in the event, unlikely event that we had to exit the hall, there's a middle door, a door there, and a door behind me. Um, during the COVID pandemic, the O'Neill County Historical Society, as an organization, suffered uh, serious disruption, as did most people. We did not collect memberships and did not produce the Dougie Neal Journal. Um, in 2023, we started to get back to normal with uh, regular talks here at uh, Benbourg Prairie. We produced our 26th journal, and our membership is now growing towards the pre-COVID levels. I would encourage anyone who has not already uh, uh, subscribe to, to the uh, society to do so and collect their journal, though I believe we're short of them down there at the moment, but I can get some before the night's out. Uh, the subject tonight, tonight's talk, was first mooted to me at any rate by the late Brendan McAnallan, who had actually started to research this subject. Unfortunately, Brendan took ill and passed uh, the baton, as it were, to his son Donald. Uh, Donald has intensively researched uh, this subject and the, uh, and the period surrounding it, and we will hear the first part of the, his work tonight. When I looked at this period, um, when I looked first at this period, we're just going to finish. When I looked uh, at this period of our history, I, I uh, cannot help thinking of what's happening in the Rwanda thing today, because there are certain similarities uh, of uh, where uh, the English government in charge of Ireland were sending people to uh, a different country and a different land for whatever purpose. Um, that's just, it just occurred to me when I was reading the paper that there's, there's a certain amount of similarities. Um, so to cut it short, we wanna get moving here I now call on Donald to, to give us his talk on the history of the period. Thank you, Donald. Gramaga James, August Gramaga Picardia, Taha Sorum Puyero, Gabal Jeshogam, Lord Turn Arshaw, and Gordon Moore, uh, Sanastat Parastor Scourt. Uh, for you, um, Aaron Van Vorab, August, to so long that you're not going to be caught in the show. Um, friends, I'm uh, pleased to be able to speak on this subject at last. Um, I haven't actually spoken on this subject before, so whereas you're used to just the likes of James Cain just reaming it off the page, I'm, I'm ad, it's the opposite. I'm using a lot of PowerPoint, but ad libbing, highly dangerous mix, but uh, I'll give it a go. Uh, there's too much to cover on the whole subject, that's why it's broken into two. And it's, I may have to cut this short, depending on the time, as it is past nine. So um, I suppose the first point is picking up what James said there. Uh, the start of my father, it start, this actually goes back to the early days of coming to the O'Neill Country Historic Society. Um, because um, as, he himself, as my father, uh, late father, recorded in the most recent Duchenil, uh, in an obituary to Dr. Brian Trainer of Prony. He referred to some of the early talks given here in the mid 80s, where Brian Trainer came and brought census records comparing 1841 to 1851, covering the, covering the Great Famine years and showing the huge drop in population in the townlands around Ben Burb, and that this had caused considerable interest and intrigue, and I suppose had led in its own way to the furtherance of the cause of local history at a very fertile time for local history research in areas such as this. And that then eventually reached some fruition in an article published in Duhon in number 10, 1995-96, by Charles Dillon, uh, Starvation in the Midst of Plenty. And uh, it demonstrated those facts and figures quite graphically in map form and uh, other ways. Um, Due to the maybe the lack of full range of sources available at that time, it wasn't possible to explain 
uh, to, the, to the extent maybe that we might wish expect today, not just the figures, but the why. Why did the figures drop so much? Um, and this was something that intrigued my father because, well, James didn't tell you the full story there. In January 2020, he gave me the, this article which was on the famine period and a bit before it, and he, it was about 8,000 words, and he said, would you edit that? Big mistake. Uh, but two years later, well, I'd probably, around the time of day, I had reached 40,000 words, <laughs> 500 fold. Uh, and I can assure you, given the depth of material that's actually available in this, I, I promise you, for once, I wasn't overrating. Um, but uh, it's, it became too big to publish in Doohan Hill, so I'm now trying to find the right way of bringing it out uh, when it's all the, all the I's are dotted, etc. But um, the... Uh, one of the things that my father had written in the original draft of this was that how could you explain this huge drop in population, particularly whenever there were no known famine graves in this immediate area? He said that he had heard from his father in turn, who was born in 1903, about traditions of people lying stricken on the side of the road, for example, in the road between Athnatoy and Caledon, but hadn't heard of similar graves or stories from this immediate area. And indeed, in some respects, this might be considered a more fertile area than, for example, further west. Um, so these are some of the reasons that, that really, in, the things that really intrigued him. And uh, this is a picture of him uh, taken by Fergus, I don't know, three or four years ago, trying to work out where he, where he reckoned that uh, food was being dispensed from a soup kitchen on the old um, Paris Court Arms Hotel, which is now the pub and everything else there. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not, I, 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 I'm not sure that he was right about it, but we'll come back to that. Okay, now, um, now, I'm going to have to apologise that a lot of, you came here to hear about the famine. A lot of this is actually about the decade or so before the famine. But you cannot understand what happened in an area like this during the famine unless you understand what happened in the previous 10 to 15 years. Because there were a lot of uh, circumstances that had built up this huge tension on the land and tension among the populace that caused the, the, fa the famine of such profound effects. Uh, it, you know, you cannot separate these things. Um, there is the, uh, uh, a map from Charles Dillon's article. Now, again, something else I must stress here. Um, actually, well, sorry, a, a, a couple of points I'll make before I get into that. A lot of this is based on new research. So it's from National Library of Ireland, where the Paris Court papers are, National Archives of Ireland, where the Famine Relief Commission papers are, um, PRONI, digitised newspapers that are such a rich source now. My talk is image-led, but I would stress, please do not strain your eyes trying to read this, because a lot of it's going to be too small. I just use it as a prompt, a visual prompt for me, and I will tell you the necessary information. What I'm trying to show, show, show when I put these up is just the breadth and authenticity of sources. It's not for you to try and strain your eyes, because you won't be able to read a lot of it. So, but in this case, so this is, for example, where Charles Dillon left it in 1996. So you can see, uh, or you can't see, but I'll show you. So Ben Burb is pretty much, in the, is it white in the middle there? And the percentage loss or gain, uh, he actually chose to, this map to include Clonfacal, Aglish and Loch Gall. Now, a very important caveat to understand, be, be wary of terminology of place names. This is not the Aglish village that many of you will know today. This is Aglish as in the civil parish of Aglish on the Armagh side of the border, which corresponds, and we're going to get into trouble, corresponds with what people nowadays call Tully Sarn, but it's absolute. What people call Tully Sarn is not Tully Sarn, and what people then call Aglish is not what you now call Aglish, <laughs> right? So the old Aglish was essentially Glenall um, and other names like that, uh, covering from just over the border of the counties here, right up to maybe Napa uh, and, and around there, uh, crossroads and, and, and closer towards Armagh. But it's uh, any reference, sorry, I'll tell you when we're talking about Aglish Village and we're talking about Aglish Civil Parish because they're two separate things. So, in this case, he's talking about Aglish Civil Parish in Armagh and Clonfacal Civil Parish, not Clonfacal Catholic Parish, but Clonfacal Civil Parish, which includes all of Aglish Catholic Parish in Tyrone as well. So, so, you have everything from over in the far corner, Carry Castle, Mully Carr, right across to Tully, Roan, and Copney in North Armagh, uh, and so on. But in this map uh, that uh, by Charles Dillon, for example, he had documented percentage loss or gain of population. So he chose a, a graphic here for 39 to minus 39 to minus 79. It's a rather large bracket, I would think. But anyway, in that color, he shaded the likes of, on the far uh, left side here, you've got likes of 
uh, Carry Castle, Molly Carr, Derry Latney, Clarney, Gort Maran, Not in Floy, uh, Not Side of Eglish Par, or you know the Catholic Eglish Tyrone Parish today, uh, and then uh, and then if you look down uh, down here in what's now known as Tully Sarn, but really Ag Glenall, Eglish, uh, Armagh, you have places like Mullen Townland, such as Mullen Tower, Cabra, Lisbon, Bally, Brocky, Artisuli, uh, Molly Lachan. Uh, all in this bracket, 40% plus dro drop in population in one decade. And then uh, it also includes places like Kilnacart, Lagilly, Bolan, Sanahan Row, Molly Carnan, Lis Mulrevy, these are up towards the top. Uh, Moss Moor, Gorristown, Lis Gobbin, Tolligoni, uh, and um, Derry Cree. And then, I suppose crucially for Ben Burb, if you look, Ben Burb's in white there at the minute, so it hasn't really, it's at a minimum, it's at a small enough population uh, increase actually, I think. Very, Ben Burb and Bross Loy, uh, beside Eglis, hardly anywhere else during that decade. But if you look at the, the townlands immediately around Ben Burb, they're all it's a very significant population decline. So that includes Tully Moratra in the Armagh side of the border, side of the border, but also Drumplough, Lis Duff, uh, Drumgus, Tully Gon uh, also uh, Derry Goonan, Derry Creevy, uh, Kilnagru, and Lis Nacroy. So that's where it was left on that, uh, and to that extent now. What I should also explain is that what do we mean when we talk about the parish court estate? Because you know it's not immediately evident. The parish court estate, many, some of you will know, some of you won't know. But parish court estate, well, there were there were four parish court estates essentially, or at least in four counties. You will know many of that. There's a village called Parish Court in County Wicklow, and it's the highest waterfall in Ireland, and that essentially was the largest parish court estate in North Wicklow, and also, uh, and that's essentially where the the residents. Uh, of the Viscounts, Lords and Viscounts par Parish Court was. There was also a portion of South Dublin nearby, and also a portion in County Wexford. But strangely, you might think as well, there was also this little pocket of uh, Tyrone. And do we have it here? Uh, there's, there, there it is there. So this is from the, over here, this is, I, I shamefully, I shamelessly just photographed it from over, over the way here. Uh, so. So in, on the north end, it goes up to Mullet Dolly there, which is right up beside the end of the motorway or the start of the A4, uh, just board, <coughs> bordering it today. Uh, down on the bottom corner, Knock Nacloy, which is um, the edge of the Brantry, and also the outlier of Drumskinny, which it said that Lord Parscourt won from Lord Callan in a game of cards. Uh, uh, and then goes over as far here, past Ben Burb. Ben Burb is the not in the middle of it, but the administrative headquarters in Ben Burb over to Moyard, in the direction of Blackwater Town, but not going that far. And then there are a few townlands which weren't actually part of the estate, but may as well have been in that there were glebe lands. So some of you will know of the glebe today, in, in a local sense, the glebe being between here and the Moy. Well, that includes the townlands of Tubbermessen, Mullab Mossog, and Anagasna, which were effectively sort of in accord with the estate, but there were separate church lands for the Church of Ireland. And then it goes right up to the edge Colrevog, Goristown, uh, Brohadui, Colcairn, right up the edge of the Moy as it is today, although the Moy wouldn't have extended out that far back then. So that's the broad sweep of 48 townlands we're talking about. And when we talk about the estate, we're not just talking about the ge geography, we're also talking about the officialdom that ran it and the people of it. So I feel like I've already given a whole lecture. I read all about it. The, uh, the, um, there, there, by the way, there's the other. I'm, I'm not going to go all through all Charles Dillon's basic statistics on these tonight because, uh, well, elaborate, but the, the, the bare facts, I mean, uh, tonight. But here's just the summary of some of them. I'll return to these the second occasion. So if you look at, uh, by, in that decade, eight, Ireland, eight, from 8.175 8, 8 million in 1841 to 6552, um, a drop of, mi of minus 19.85%. Armagh was minus 15.65. Tyrone was minus 18.31. The Barney of Dugannon, minus 20.55. And uh, now the Barony of Tur do we, do we say Tirani? Uh, Barony of Tirani, which includes Glenall, modern description Tully Saran, and right down as far as Tynan, and even maybe close to Katie. Strange shape of a barony. Uh, at minus 33%. And then Eglish Parish, sorry, sorry, I've made a mistake there. That's the Eglish Parish part of Tirani, that's in Armagh, minus 31%. Note also very significantly high figures. Clonfacal Parish, Dungannon Park, minus 28.95%. Uh, 
and Clontakel Parish Armagh 20, minus 25.51%. And the strange thing about all this is that when you compare this to a lot of parts of, say, a lot of Tyrone among the bushes, like more, with sort of, let's say, the more remote parts of the county, actually, so the population drop wasn't as high in a lot of those places. Now, we can touch up about that in due course, but these, these are among the, among the highest figures in the county. Uh, now, so, who was Parish Court? Uh, well, this was the sixth Viscount Parish Court. Uh, he was born in 1950, sorry, 1815, Richard Wingfield. He married his first cousin, Lady Elizabeth Frances Charlotte. She was the daughter of the Earl of, Ro Earl of, Ro Earl of Roden. They married in 1836. The Earl of Roden is a huge figure in, in this man's life and ended up becoming a huge figure in the story of the famine in this estate. Uh, so that's his father-in-law. He was the MP for Bath in England from 1837 to 1841 and lived in Italy. So he was abs definitely the, how you would just describe an, absolute, an absentee landlord. And that's, uh, that's pretty much all you need to know about him, except that also that his great, great, great granddaughter was Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York. So uh, there you are. Um, the, uh, now this is an account of his visit to uh, Ben Burb in 1836, and he's just come of age, and he's just turned 21. He's, 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 his son, Mervyn's just born, so everything's going pretty well for him. And look, look at this great uh, reception he got in Ben Burb. So, um, Grand Fed of Ben Burb. On the night of the 17th instant, uh, the village of Ben Burb and surrounding neighbourhood presented a brilliant spectacle in honour of the birth of the son and heir to the, the honoured and worthy landlord, Lord Vis Viscount Paris Court. The village was handsomely illuminated, the vast crowds of the tenantry assembled at the principal bonfire on Listoff Hill. That would be, was that just over here behind um, Alexander Mills? Would it be over that direction? Or am I, where am I, am I getting mixed up in my geography here, sorry? Where's Listoff Hill? Okay, if nobody can come, oh, yes, Patsy? <laughs> oh, this, side the, this side, sorry, yeah, sorry. You can't trust housing estate names nowadays, so that's why I didn't go there. You know. uh, so they were met there by the Lordship's agent, Captain Cranfield who with his usual good nature and willingness to add to their enjoyment, had provided the evening's festivity eight barrels of Lyle's best ale. The health of Lady and Lord, Par Lord and Lady Parscott and their infant son and heir, and may God bless them all, having been proposed, was responded to with a vast crowd assembled with most deafening shouts. The cheering was kept up for a considerable time. When it had subsided to work, they went, and the ale was ushered around the mo joyous multitude with all the dispatch imaginable. Captain Cranfield, in company with some of the neighbouring gentry, returned to the castle, Benbert Castle, at 8 o'clock, that's where he's living at the time, uh, the sport of the night was kept up on List of Hill and in the village till a late hour when the crowd returned to their respective homes without the slightest disturbance. And this was sort of syndicate news around various newspapers at that time. So, isn't this going great, you know? So, Cap so Captain, who was Captain Cranfield? Captain Cranfield doesn't actually live in Ben Burb during the period of the famine, but he is such another important figure. Isn't it funny that, this, or, or, no, sorry, it's a strange irony, that the Earl of Roden and Captain Cranfield, neither of them lived in Ben Burb area during the famine, but they're two of the most significant figures in this story. Captain George Darley Cranfield was the agent of the estate from 1836 to 1844. He had served as an army officer and as the moral agent as a, 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 to the young Viscount in, during his minority years. So in other words, he looked after him and gave him moral instruction. Uh, and it, it, he definitely, from his military background, possessed very considerable pers uh, skills um, and administration, administrative ability to manage the estate in accordance with the wishes of his master. Um, and uh, the estate accounts bear out his attention to detail in many tasks, beside construction and maintenance of buildings and payments to myriad wor workers on the estate and to the purchase of fuels and much else and all the bookkeeping along with it. And what happened during these next few years was there was a, ben Bur the modern village of Ben Burb, I would argue actually to a large extent, in the streets, the streetscape took shape because so much of what you see today was built in the next five to seven years from, the, from then on. Uh, so uh, again, you won't be able to read this, but from this account, from these are the, from the estate accounts. So for example, you have up here, I don't know if this is, can you bleep that? But, uh, so he, it talks about um, Viscount Parascoint, second subscription to the Presbyterian Meeting House of Ben Burr. The meeting house was built in 1839 and opened by Reverend Henry Cook in that year. Um, there's also a uh, subscription to Derry Gotrevy School. Roden himself had made subscriptions so that six Hibernian uh, schools would be, uh, would be uh, built in this area. Now these were, these, this, these were not national schools. 
the National, National Board of Education set up uh, late, well, late 20s, early 1830s. But these, they did not recognise the National Board of Education. These were Hibernian uh, scripture schools to be very much uh, along Protestant teaching. And then you had, um, so you had these, Lilburns built the, our Paris Court Arms of Hell in the late 1830s or early 1840s. Um, uh, also documented in these accounts is the damage done by the night of the big wind in 1839 and all the repairs done to that. So then you had, uh, what else was built during this time? The village courthouse, the police barracks, which is over the road, I think, uh, or James can contradict me in this, uh, and bakehouse, mills and houses, and um, uh, he granted the site for the Presbyterian meeting house. And uh, what else? Uh, the, uh, there was a shop within the Paris Court Arms. In 1845, the Postmaster General authorised the opening of a post office on the premises. Uh, Banberg Manor House was built between 1842 and 44 to be the estate agent's dwelling, and it was very ornate, ornately decorated. Um, uh, uh, Banberg, I think, is quite similar to Ennis Gary Wicklow in design. And uh, then at the same time, there were transport links forged into all the construction. This wasn't of, of the, the estate's doing, but at this time, you know, the, the edifice of Ben Bourbon and its surrounds, the, consider the Ulster Canal with six locks skirting the village, uh, linked it to Loch Erne and Loch Ney from the 1930s or late 1930s. And there was a new road to Dungannon being worked on in the early 1840s. Uh, a large amount of money had been expended in the new line of road from Loch Ness to Ben Burb by 1843. Uh, a new line of road was talked about from Ben Burb to Blackwater Town, and there was even talk in 1845 about railway link. The, the new railway line, were, uh, railways were being built, and Ben Burb was at one point in 1845 going to be part of this. And there was also an, an establishment, embroi establishment for embroidery in Ben Burb, employing nearly 200 girls, the press accounts reported. So there was a lot of things going on, and ostensibly, you know, they'd never had it so good. But there was another story altogether going on here. And I, I'll try to do some justice to it, but it's hard. Ben Burb um, and areas like it, well, Ben Burb was, as some of you may know, it was sort of towards the corner of what's call, what was called the Linen Triangle. I suppose Dungannon and Armagh were both sort of regarded as being corners of it as far as Lisburn. And Ben Burb had a significant um, benefit from the boom in the linen industry in the 18th century. I mean, I'm not going to do justice to that subject tonight, but what happened, uh, so the, the, the cottage weaving industry, uh, you know, this enabled people, uh, th what happened then was the, the huge population increase that happened in so many parts of Ireland in the late 18th century and early 19th century was largely enabled by the fact that subdivision could take place on farms, so farms could become shared out with next gen different siblings and so on, and they could continue to survive because even with a small plot of land, they had potato as a very nutritional food on which to live uh, while, it was, while it was going well. And they could su supplement their small farming income with cottage weaving by night. That's it in the, most sim the simplest form, and I don't claim to know all the, the aspects of it. But So this meant even though the population was becoming more, you know, uh, it was becoming much bigger and less, less uh, amount, the, the amount of land for different small farmers was decreasing per person. Uh, it meant that for those few decades, things were still holding together quite well. But decline began to set in, particularly after the, uh, around the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, something of an economic crisis. Uh, the mechanisation of the linen industry began to cause the decline of cottage weaving. Uh, bleach greens that you would have seen around places like here, around the Blackwater, uh, became empty. They were displaced by yarn manufacturers. Something else which people don't necessarily consider that the improvements that landlords were bringing, they were, they were reclaiming bog land, but when they reclaimed the bog, they took away uh, a significant fuel supply of turf from many people, from many small farmers. Um, uh, and by the 1830s, there was general underemployment, underemployment around the land, and small holdings were gradually less able to generate subsistence and rent. And this map is from Frank Wright's book, um, I'm sorry, pardon me, but the angle, uh, two lands and one soil. And it's just, uh, it's, if you can sort of guess where Ben Burb is sort of close enough to this corner of Loch Ness, you can see that uh, it, the proportion of adult males in rural parish populations ministering to clothing in 1841, it's, it seems to be down, I'm not sure if exactly if it's the third, 24 to 33 or the 14 to 18%, but you can see even what had been the linen triangle 
on this end is, is, has really taken a significant hit by uh, the 1830s, 40s period. Uh, now, Captain Cranfield. So it's fascinating to see now some of the evidence he gave. The, uh, due to the pressure on the land and the, the, in, the advent of the poor laws in the 18, late 1830s, uh, there was a Devon Commission brought, established to um, inquire into the working of them. So Captain Cranfield's evidence at given at Callum in 18, 1844 was based on his previous eight years on the estate here. So what he said, what, these are the questions and answers. So he was uh, where, where, he lives at Blackwater at this stage. He's the he talks about his, he was a captain in the army and an agent of the estate here. He's resided here eight years uh, uh, and for Paris Court, Lord Paris Court. Uh, he gives the uh, description of the land as strictly arable with the exception of about 50 acres of bog. What's the population on the estate? 859 families of farmers, 2,239 males, 2,172 females, total 4,411 soul, souls, uh, 276 families of cottiers, um, and um, so on. Now, this was a census that he had undertaken. Now, there was a national census in 1841, but this is a census that he himself, being such an organiser, had, had organised. But the evidence gets more interesting as you go along. Uh, so he then talks, he was asked about the consolidation of farms. Now, for those unfamiliar with the term, consolidation of farms essentially meant pushing small, or making two small farms into one, or maybe more than two, because the subletting had made so many small farms so small. So it, a lot of landlords came by this stage to say, look, we need to stop farms getting so small. We need to make them viable. We need to consolidate them, bring them together. So he's asked about consolidation, and he says, yes, there has been some. When a tenant wishes to dispose of his tenant right, his farm is added to the adjoining land or to the two adjoining farms, uh, not with a view to form large grazing farms. Very little has been done. 71 farms of less than 10 acres have been struck out uh, since he had become agent. Uh, where have the people gone of these 71 farms? They have generally gone to America. So this is significant. So you can see there is a considerable outflow of people already by 1844. So when you're talking about the population decline from 1841 to 51, it's not, you can see a significant uh, rate of them is already departing from America, departing the land before the famine actually takes hold. Um, yes, they were fully compensated with the exception of two or three who were put out for misconduct. Um, it doesn't allow subletting or subdivision anymore of farms. Um, if it was attempted, he threatened to expel the tenants. Um, and so he's asked whether the large family's lot was improving or the reverse. I, sh I should think not improving. The small tenantry improving? Decidedly not. Um, is the condition of the labourers getting better? No. Uh, the low uh, what do you conceive, conceive to be the cause of the general depreciation? The low price of produce and the want of employment for the weavers. Uh, and uh, so he's talked about the capital. So now, there's another aspect to this, and um, it's a difficult subject, uh, but it's it, it's absolutely relevant to this to this uh, to this subject. You cannot deal with it, um, the the issue of the famine in this era, without uh, bringing this into the equation, and that is the sectarian tensions that were in existence at that time, and there are many manifestations of them through documents of that period. And, uh, oh sorry, here, before I go there, sorry, it's all falling apart in here. The, look at this, so this is some of the stuff you find in the National Archives in Dublin. So this is an example of a tension on the land before I get into This is not a sectarian thing, but this is a threatening letter that was to, Mr. Uh, to a Paddy Quinn. So I'll try and read this, so in 1837. Uh, Paddy Quinn, when your neighbor's house is on fire, take care of your own. You are now warned, uh, neither rent, swap, or occupy the place that Thomas Err freed from Donnelly. If you do, you will get a touch. You will something, something. But the majority allow you to be first warned. Uh, you may think that great men may love you, but they can't love, them, they can't love themselves. Or I think I just love it. <laughs> Maybe I got the word love wrong there. But for, for we declare in presence of God, the person or persons who keeps it after this warning will meet with and their death be on themselves. So this is not a unique one. Now there were there was burning of the uh, Quinn. I think it was the same Quinn in Van Burb and a man called Oliver and Derry Creevy. Both of their houses burned in 1837, and and, and there's a report on this there. 
Uh, and then look at look at Cranfield. Look at Cranfield. Cranfield's only here a short amount of time, and he gets this. I think he's only here like a couple of months when he gets this warning. So this is something else. Warning to Captain Cranfield. This was posted on the gate of his residence at Benburb Castle at that time. So warning to Captain Ca Cranfield. Sorry, the light's shining there, sir. Uh, of, of the tyranny, sorry, I have to just, beware of the tyranny you seem to use over Ben Burb estate. It will cause the old castle to become a scullabogue barn. A scullabogue barn is a reference to an episode in the 1798 Rising in Wexford where a barn of Protestants was uh, burnt and a lot of them killed for that. Uh, we will pay any rent willingly, we are able, but you uh, w wish to starve one part of the people and have godly obedience from the other. I presume that means the Catholic people starved and the godly obedience from the Protestants. You must be of infidel turn. The tenants of other estates will join in doing away with you. This is suggesting that they're actually lining up, they're, they're ganging up with other estates to take action here. Uh, for, your sh for your spilling the girl's milk with such endly power and attempting to kill the child on the road, we will not suffer to be turned out of our houses and places. We will shoot you. Uh, and any other tyrant infidel who will do so. If you be a good agent, we will be a good tenantry. If you be a tyrant, we will be hostile and not suffer it. So this is a police copy of this. And um, of course the police weren't that, the regular police weren't, the Irish constabulary weren't that long in existence. They'd only been instituted in the 19, 1820s under Robert Peel. Uh, but uh, so, Lots of aspects. This, the police reckoned that this showed that you know th this was intri They were actually intrigued by this because the references to other estates and it seemed to almost be combining people across the sectarian divide. But anyway, so you can see Cranfield had got was had got people's back up from the start. But this this is the difficult territory to get into. But it's referred to in a couple of sources. Cranfield evidence. Look at the uh, look at the evidence on the right. First of all, this was in the same 1844 evidence that I've shown you a moment ago. So does the land have always, uh, sorry, is there an, any objection ever made to a tenant except on the ground of his not being a solvent person or being of good character? Yes, decidedly. With respect to religion, I would refer a Protestant tenant to a, Ro to a Roman Catholic tenant most assuredly. What is the general class of tenants upon the estate? They are nearly balanced, but the advantage is on the side of the Protestants. If a Roman Catholic was to sell his land, has he prevented selling it to a Roman Catholic? No, but when it could be done, I would prefer a Protestant. But I by no means prevent a Roman Catholic selling it to a Roman Catholic. Is a Protestant prevented selling to a Roman Catholic? Yes. Uh, if both a Protestant and a Roman Catholic offered for a farm, would you make a selection? Yes, I should certainly give it to the Protestant if he was a man of good character. But I should state that as entirely left to his own hands. Uh, it is left to my discretion. Um, there is no difference made between the persons of one religion and another in the management of the state, but in letting a farm, I prefer a Protestant to a Roman Catholic. Uh, now, the, this was actually referred to in... I referred to Frank Wright's book, uh, Two Lands and One Soil, and uh, he's talking about sectarian tensions in the 1830s, but he says, uh, referring to us, he says, the only outward sign of a, pro hey, what he calls, and I'm quoting his words, the only, uh, da, 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 he, said, he said, in these areas, small holdings might be readily exposed to competitive tenant right bids. And in the linen crisis of the early 1830s, when political cost contestation was rising, the question of who held the land might be resolved by issues of strength. But the only outward sign of a Protestant colonisation policy in 1844 was in the Paris Court Estate at Ben Burb. The agent operated the policy that Protestants must sell to Protestants, but Catholics must sell to Catholics. So he's, I think he's essentially referring to this, but he's identifying this as quite unique at that time. You also see re re references that it didn't just apply to the estate itself, but it also applied to the glebe lands between here and the Moy. So this is a reference in the Northern Standard newspaper, which was uh, a Protestant uh, audience newspaper, essentially. Uh, the Moy, we feel much pleasure in learning that the cause of Protestantism is not on the wane in the district of Moy. The Protestant landlords and church clergy of that neighbourhood are in the most praiseworthy manner, cultivating the most friendly feelings between themselves and their tenantry by granting leases to Protestant tenants and manifesting other symptoms for, of regard for the better encouragement of Protestant settlers in their lands. And then it talks about the gratitude they deserve to the, the Purdue Protestant, or C Colonel Werner MP, and the Reverend Henry Griffin of Clonfacal, who lived on the Glebe land at that time. He later became Bishop of Limerick. So, um, you know, so the reason for, for this is that this does actually tie in. To this, you can see that the policy was already in place. So this raises questions when we consider the fullness of the famine. Whether, did this apply during the famine in terms of when hard decisions had to be made, when the harder decisions as the famine wore on had to be made about who got to stay and who was evicted and all these things? Does that come? 
in the equation. It also raises the question, well, uh, about the whole question of, did superism, the, did the whole question of was soup used to convert people? Now, I'll come back to that uh, in due course. But you can see manifestations of this. These are from the National Archives again. This is a poster from Ben Gannon. Uh, it's the, the you see, this is the post. The reason why tensions also were so high is, and I didn't actually say it, is this is the post-emancipation decade, 1829, Catholic emancipation, uh, and Catholic priests then became involved in politics. Daniel O'Connell had become such a powerful figure. Uh, there was a great fear among the Protestant population that O'Connellism was going to sweep the whole land. And in this this whole sort of area, like Ben Burb, Killyman, the Moy, Dungannon, etc., it was almost like a frontier that they were putting up the ramparts that, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to concede. And, uh, you know, so this is an example of this. And uh, the, there was a very determined effort, to, 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 or a, very, a great fear that, 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 that emancipation would, would lead to uh, home rule, but, well, it wasn't called home rule then, but, uh, you know, Rome rule, essentially, as well, and all of that. And the, uh, um, so this, this, po this poster, for example, Protestants and Gannon, the radicals and papists are endeavouring to get up an illumination on the arrival of Lord Ranfurly. So Lord Ranfurly was showing maybe wing tendencies at that time. And it's warning against popery and every act of the present government, uh, which the, the Lord Ranfurly is a staunch supporter, uh, or there'd be the ruins of Protestantism. So, and it mentions, da uh, what is it, Dan's finest peasantry at the bottom, Daniel O'Connell, uh, who would break your windows. Um, so there's a great deal of fear. Um, and this was also, there was also a great deal of fear on the Catholics' part that they would lose the newly, the, 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 that emancipation might be rolled back on as well. Um, for example, uh, between 1793 and 1829, 40 shillings freeholders were allowed to vote, but that was ended in 1829. The rate was increased to £10 for everyone, so it's a 500% increase. Um, so this meant that landlords could have uh, could you know had much more control again, um, and in those days there was no such thing as a secret ballot. It was evident which way you voted. Um, so um, th th these are some examples. And how did this how did this come into play in local level? How does this affect? Well, the poor law was brought in in 1838-39, and it was meant to help relieve the tension on the land. But uh, what it meant uh, what what the outworkings of this, you know, for example, what, what how did this one of the things that was in the accounts earlier I failed to show you was that you could see actually there's an expenditure in the parish court accounts where they were had done a, they had done sort of a petition against the removal of the corn laws. So uh, and uh, so the, the 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 introduction of the poor law brought the introduction of elections for poor law guardians. So there's a new form of local government at a very basic level, but. The landlord classes weren't really weren't really keen that the wrong people, wig leaning people, would get elected. So, uh, it was alleged that uh, it was alleged by uh, well, actually, it was alleged by none other than Reverend Michael Coyne, the parish priest of Clonfacal, in from the pulpit in the church of St John's in the Moy. Uh, he actually pulled people, the parishioners, to go out and vote for the two. Uh, smaller landlords, I think they were, one of them was Greer, was it? Um, they, they, they vote for them because, uh, they, well, uh, they, that, they, because the Paris Court of State uh, had actually sent bailiffs around telling people to vote for the two other candidates or they mightn't get a loan, for, the farmers mightn't get a loan from the Ben Burb Loan Fund. And, uh, you know, so, the, the, so, now, Michael Coyne is a significant figure in this too. I can only presume, I, there's an unfortunate sh shortage of records. There were seven coin priests, seven, in the Archbishop Archdiocese of Armagh, Catholic Archdiocese of Armagh in the 19th century. I can only guess that some of them were from around Plinty Clay, Clonmore, somewhere like that. Uh, but we don't have all their records. But two of the key, so Michael Coyne is one of two key priests called Coyne in this period. So Michael Coyne was definitely politically uh, uh, um, alert and politically active in this. And so you find then, uh, that th this is in the Vindicator, which was a, a new, new Catholic slash nationalist newspaper in Belfast, are edited by Gavin Duffy. And uh, you can find that some, a lot of stuff in there about the Moy uh, and complaints about how, uh, like, in fact, Cranfield in the courthouse in Dungannon had complained about Michael Coyne, Reverend Coyne, using the church for politicization of this and, and so on. And uh, 
you can find them by 1840. Uh, you find that Father Coyne and Father Quinn and a few other gentlemen or prepared a petition against the attempt of Lord Stanley to destroy the franchise of the people of Ireland. And 1,400 signatures had been uh, appended to this petition within a few short hours in the chapel yard. So this is all ra raising the tension. This is all putting, this is all bringing an, an increase. It's raising the sectarian tensions, all these things. And I mean, the Moy was something else at that time. F Father Coyne wrote repeated letters to Lord Charlemont, who had a residence in Roxburgh Castle. He was asking him to spend more time living there to, to calm down, if he could help to calm down the tensions. Um, if I have it, the, he was act his own house was attacked several times. I'm not sure if the Church of St John, and John St John's Church in the Moy was built in 1835. Before that, I think it was based out in Gorestown, I think. So the, 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 this was the new Catholic church in the Moy. So, uh, but I think he might still have lived around, I don't know if it was a parochial house, I might have lived in Colrevo, which is in the estate here, of course. And then, so for example, his house was attacked on a couple of occasions, one case by 50 or 60 men and boys, according to a police report in 1841, uh, and, and so on. There's, there's lots of different things like that. But then, on the other side of this is Eglish. Now, this is Eglish Throne, and this is a period where Eglish Village, well, I talked about Ben Burb, and it's modern edifice emerging this time. Well, Eglish Village really is coming to shape in this decade before the famine. This is a map from, 18, from 1771, of Rowan town land, and, or sorry, and the surrounding townlands. Rowan, you can't even see, there's just, there's Eglish down there. Burying place, the, the old graveyard around the church is actually marked bigger than Eglish. Eglish wasn't a place. Uh, it was just, it wasn't even a hamlet. Uh, road to Ben Burb, road to Una Bridge, which is significant. Uh, I'll come back to that. But then you step, you go forward. So what changed in Eglish? Well, uh, the priests of Eglish had had petitioned or requested a uh, parish court estate for land in which to build a, a, a new church and a school, sorry, a school. But they had this old site for the church in, on the corner of what where you now know the church to be today. The new church was built in 1834 and consecrated in 1835. And it actually had financial support from Lord Caledon, uh, 25 pounds or something like that, even though it wasn't his estate, but it didn't get any equivalent support from parish court who had built, who had helped contributed to the Protestant churches in the area. And there was probably a lingering resentment about that among the Catholic tenants. But then what happens here is um, you then have Rowan National School. Now, what was happening here? Rowan National School was, it was first, the first national school in Eglish, what's now Eglish. The attempt was made, first of all, to build it at Bross Loy, which is just over there where the fish farm is and now where Park Cormac is now, if you know it, but the, uh, at the edge of the village there. And, but they couldn't get... Um, sufficient, it, it didn't work out, it was meant to be cross-community, it didn't work out for reasons, and then a grant was originally offered and then withheld by the National Board of Education. And then the parish priest in Eglish in the late 1830s, Father O'Neill, who was new to the parish, said, look, I'm pressing on, we're going to build a, a national school, and he, he, this is what he asked the estate for. He couldn't get any land other than beside the graveyard, the old graveyard in Eglish, beside the church. And although it wasn't allowed to build churches, build sorry schools beside graveyards, it was the only place that the guests said, "Look, we're going to build this school." And uh, so that was built, opened in eighteen first 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 November first of January eighteen forty or forty one. And uh, so that's just it begins it's beginning to take shape at this time. But uh, and what's happening as well? This is a parallel of what's happening in the Moy, with the poor law elections and all this stuff going on and this tension on the land. Lo and behold. There's political sort of rumblings happening around the church in Eglish too. And so this is from the Vindicator newspaper uh, that in May 1841, the Catholic inhabitants of this parish in the chapel yard immediately after divine service under Father O'Neill adopted these resolutions about the malignant Tory party and, uh, and so on and the political religious liberty uh, and the miscreant associates, the Orange Men of Ulster. And, uh, and so this is... This would be forwarded to our beloved Queen uh, uh, in Victoria. So, you know, this is not this is not to the liking of the Paris Court Estate at all. This is not. This is really not. These. This is the first manifestation of local po Catholic, Catholic politics in Eglish, and from their perspective, this was. Hold on a minute now. We allowed them to build this new church. Allowed them to build this new school, and now look what they do. They're ho they're set, they're holding meetings there against us after their mass. You know. This is all building up the tension. And 
This led to a huge standoff in the year 1841. This is reported in the Freeman's Journal in Dublin. Um, it's entitled A Boon from the Tories, but I think that's just a, rent, I think that's just a, a cut and paste headline because it doesn't really bear any resemblance to what actually happened. Uh, an occurrence of the most malignant nature, uh, showing the ruthless disposition of the exterminating gentry, the Freeman's Journal, I should say, was a nationalist newspaper, uh, and the lenity with which the unfortunate Catholics of this country may expect to be treated in future by the Tory landlords has taken place at the National Schoolhouse attached to Eglish Chapel, a few miles south of Dungannon. This chapel and graveyard, to which the poor Catholics of this parish have lately added the schoolhouse, is situated in the estate of Lord Parishcourt and have been held by the parishioners of Eglish for upwards of 100 years, without any demand having been made on them during that period. A few months since, Captain Cranfield, a saint of the first water, who acts as agent on the estate and that in true conservative fashion, set this bailiff to demand payment for the chapel and graveyard, which was of course refused. Nothing for it occurred until Wednesday last when a person named Moore, I think it's Robert Moore was his name, came and it is said for a bribe of some £25, induced the teachers to give him the keys of the schoolhouse. He then turned out the children, locked the doors and placed a strong guard of his serfs to secure the capture. This guard has been relieved with intermission and yesterday they flocked to the scene of triumph with all the contemptuous display with, of which Ardism is so fruitful, each armed with a gun and bayonet. And as the people passed into the chapel, taunted them in the most insulting manner. Not a doubt can be entertained, but an attack was made by pre made, was premeditated by these ruthless bigots, but happily the good conduct of the people preceded their design. The opinion of eminent counsel has been taken on the subject, who will concur in pronouncing it a most legal set, uh, and so on. Proceedings will be taken immediately for the recovery of the schoolhouse. Now, there's not much more about this in the papers, but well, there is, fascinatingly, a letter from Lord Parascourt himself, or Viscount Parascourt himself, in the Parascourt, uh, uh, sorry, in the, in the, in the, Outraged papers in National Archives of Ireland. I can't really read it properly, it's just the way the light shine in there, but he basically is writing to the authorities saying, I predict on Sunday, this is the Sunday that was just reported there, I predict there could be bloodshed at, at, at a church unless you send out special uh, forces to, to police the situation. Uh, and he has a very peculiar sort of perspective on it, but I can't read it properly. There. Um, so uh, it, it's, he's, he basically, he's saying, he, he, what he actually tried to say was, he tried to claim that there was a fallout between the parish priest and the Catholic congregation over the, some management of the, of the school. So, look, we'll not go to that anymore, but this was a very significant episode, which is reflective of all this tension build up. Now, one more place in this, Una Bridge. Why Una Bridge? Well, this is a place that was consistently orange marches, parades were going to right through this time. Orange party processions were outlawed from 1835 to 1850, and this was another huge cause of uh, dis, uh, discon. Uh, consternation among the Protestant population that because of maybe an episode here or there, I don't, I'm not sure, they all, there was one particular episode not too far from here, I think around Kinnigo uh, in 1835, and then of course there was a, there was a, a Catholic was shot dead in um, 1845, Boyle in Armagh, but, but that was, but the point is processions were actually illegal for this 15 year period, uh, sorry, not 15 year period, I'm getting my, I'm getting my dates from the words, for a number of years anyway. The, um, so I'll not give you all the details, but this Una Bridge seems to have been a very significant site. And again, why, why are all these things, why are these things matter? Well, it, some of you may know this, but I suspect most don't. Some of you know that the Dian is number one Orange Lodge, but number three Orange Lodge was Derry Ahill. Number six Orange Lodge was Derry Scallop, just um, the far end of Clon Fakel, isn't it? And number four Orange Lodge was Knocknacloy. Knocknacloy, it was right beside, oh, the other, the other. Sorry, they might be the wrong order, but there, yeah, that's that's maybe that's actually the wrong order. Sorry, sorry, use the wrong image, but anyway, Lockhart's in Lockhart's in. So that's that used to be Jim Donnelly's house beside it. So that's as it looks pretty much today, and the house is just the other side of the Una Bridge. It's also called the Skull Bridge historically. So there's a whole history there for another night's talk. But but this in 1840, in 1840, the 150th anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, there was an orange parade from Ben Burb to Caledon, and it was said there were 200 people in the procession men and boys and playing with the uh, fifes and drums and wearing party uh, ribbons and so on and there were 1,000 supporters there. Now, okay, you know what these reports are like about the accuracy of figures, but I wonder, <coughs> given that the parades were illegal at that time, this was, well, sorry, this was the 13th of July, uh, was this the biggest orange parade in Ireland on the 12th of July? Was it from Benbury Caledon on the 150th anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne? I think it might have been. Um, and but the police did instigate prosecutions for this, for on against a couple of the paraders. Uh, and but it didn't. Why did it not take? Why, this was simply. It goes back to Captain Cranfield because the magistrates. There were three magistrates presided over the case, and one of them was Cranfield. And Cranfield said, "I don't. The law says that you cannot be parading 
for religious and political purposes, these are illegal. But I don't see how a parade take because this, the twelfth of July was a Sunday. I don't see how a parade taking place on the thirteenth of July could be political. And he had, there was only three magistrates, and that meant that there were no prosecutions. And that sort of reflects again a lot of the Catholic dis disquiet about the way the magistracy operated at that time. Uh, um, and this is another example of the, or, uh, an orange parade on Christmas Day, eighteen forty, which was from Ben Burb to Crewbridge, where it was said that they. Had there was a, they assembled at the house of a man called Joseph Skittington. Now, I don't know if that's Skeffington or if that's correct. Shots were fired and so on. Now you can't take all these as being literal, but uh, fascinatingly, they, they went from there and they, they went proceeded with, they, with increased numbers marched to a place called the Black Cash. Now a couple of you here today have asked, where is the Black Cash? Cash is a rope bridge in Irish. Is this, is this in, is this, do we think this is in around Carl Coleman? Is this an opposite Irvin's Farm Supplies? Because the Black Lane is in around Stally leading down there, um, from down the hill. So it's possible it's in there, in the Black Cash is in there, in Carroll Coleman area. But it's not a place name that anybody really would ever use today. But it obviously was one used back then. But again, on Christmas Day, who would have thought? Uh, uh, so there's, uh, that's one of the, report, the reports of Father Coyne, as we're talking about. And it do, it, Cran, Cranfield's different attitude of playing the law some, sometimes took really extraordinary turns. In 1842, he's writing to the authorities in Dublin, Dublin Castle, asking them what, whether he should instigate prosecution against John Daly of Finlay, who was raffling chickens on a Sunday in, 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 in October 1842. And apparently, 100 men and boys went, uh, Protestants, it says in the letter, went to his house seeking to uh, assault him. And he was saying, well, should I, should I instigate a prosecution against Mr. Daly for selling chicken, for raffling chickens. I don't know what they were raffling them for. Was it for money or was it for something else? Uh, was, it, was it for sport, uh, if you call it that? Anyway, these were all the outrage reports. And someday, if you ever get a chance, the National Archives, check them out. There's the, so that's the report from him. But anyway, so where does this all lead? The, with all these tensions going on, the O'Connell was, Daniel O'Connell was having these mass meetings in Clontarf and around the south. Reportedly tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands even to be reported at them in the early 1840s for the repeal of the Union, the end of the Union which had been since 1800. Um, here is a card, a member of the Repeal Association of Ireland, of Mr Edward White of Ben Burb from 1843. And this shows you, this, this, I found this online, uh, I don't know exactly where Mr White lived, but the very, the, the very fact of this card is evidence the fact that this was this was growing, this was spreading, and this was raising real alarm bells. And what was really raising alarm bells among the, the, the establishment here and the Protestant section of the population wasn't so much the repeal members who were association members who were being recruited among the Catholic population, but some of their own might be. And this was really causing huge concern. And so you find in 1843, the Protestant Confederation Society of Ben Burb is formed, because I think this was my way of getting around some legal barrier or so whatever, and come out with all these uh, resolutions viewing with alarm the coldness and apathy of the government on the question of the repeal of the Union and that we, as in 1690, you know, seek the means under God of rescuing our country from the iron grasp of popery and saving Ireland for the British Crown and we heartily adopt and will wa willingly follow the advice of our good and tried friend, the Earl of Roden. And it does seem that, there were, that this local effort was very much trying to please the Earl of Roden, uh, who was a Grand Master of the Orange Order in the 1830s leading evangelical figure and the founder, as I said, of the Abernian School. The Newry Telegraph was a big supporter. Funny, a lot of the main newspaper the news, news at this time was not through Belfast or Dublin. Actually, the Newry Telegraph for the Unionist and the Newry Examiner, it reflects the fact that Newry Canal had been, had been a big economic driver in the decades and more before that. Um, now, the Earl of Roden, there he is. He was, I mentioned some about him earlier. He was, a, probably in the 1840s, the most significant Irish voice in the House of Lords. And he... Was, had been in the royal household since the 1900s or 1910s. He had had several significant roles. Uh, I'll not go into all of them now, but he had been an MP for Louth. He was, he, had done, he was very well known and very well regarded in Westminster, uh, but he had become a sort of a, a figure of loathing among the Catholic population. They saw his evangelical zeal, and it was evangelical, but he, his evangelical zeal as bigotry, and they saw that not only in uh, sorry in an area like this, but also in Wicklow, that there were religious application, the religious property qualifications, and you couldn't build a church here, and all this sort of thing. So, 
I don't know the full story on that, but that was what they asserted numerous times. Uh, and here, uh, this is the sort of, so this is, for example, the 12th of July, 1843, at Ben Burb. This is in the Paris Court Arms Hotel, just across the road. 60 good, in order to get, Roden was appealing them, do not, do not be lured, do not be tempted into breaking the law by these repeal people. Do not be tempted into, they want to incite you to do something, and they don't want you to do something violent. Don't do that, do not break the law. So they met in the Paris Court Arms Hotel, had a, had a sumptuous repast, and made all these uh, dedications to Enniskill and Derry at Ahram and the Boyne. Uh, flags were unveiled. Robert Moore was chaired the meeting and various, so they were toasting Prince Albert and the rest of the royal family, nine times nine, and uh, the glorious and pious and immortal memory, Her Majesty's minister, ministers, and may they remember that they are the representatives of conservative constituents, three times three, and cheers, and so on. And then it lists all these people. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, this is, you know, this is not just, I mean, this is an attempt to sort of galvanize. It's an attempt to find solidarity at a time where, of great uncertainty. Um, and lo and behold, with all this fear growing up, who comes back but Viscount Paris Court in September 1843? And it's described in the Unionist press of, with great glowing reports of how uh, as he reached the summit of the hill. Uh, I was talking about the agricultural prosperity of Ireland and uh, the noble landlord visiting, and then as he reached the summit of the hill from whence the first view of his throne estate was to be obtained, an assembled multitude met his eye. Upwards of 200 well mounted horsemen appeared before him well in advance towards the village of Ben Burb, where he was seen on foot thronging groups comprising more than 700 of his tenantry, thundering cheers, uh, and then joyful multitude at the centre of the rapidly improving village, and so on. So it's a really joyous scene. The, the, the flip side of that is in the Freeman's Journal, where they do a parody of what's in the Union's paper. They said, they said they actually they sort of say, well, hearing that the welcome the, the Lord had arrived, the men of Ben Burb went forth to salute him. Some rode on horses, others on asses, and a great multitude of seven hundred and fifty, uh, to whom his lordship had left neither horse nor ass or any other four-footed thing, went forth also to greet him. But they travelled on foot, and then it suggested, well, actually, we should we can't give our horses because our horses belong to the lordship. We'll give our children and our and our wives, and they can carry forth as the vehicle. So it's it, it's it's a huge attempt to lampoon. The, the way that this sort of very, what they regard as very sycophantic coverage of him because it refers to him as the resident landlord who writes from Naples, is how they describe Lord Par or Viscount Parscourt, how he just condescended to pay Ben Berber a visit for the first time in seven years. Um, so, uh, and the tenants then had this address to Parscourt. It seems that he came basically to say, look, I'm with you guys, I feel you, I'm with you, I'm in solidarity with you. Uh, and. He's, so they had said about the demagogues and agitators of this repeal of the Union, and we call on your, uh, upon your Lordship and the Friends of British Connection to rally around the Union flag of Britain. And then he responded by saying to, the, to these people who had this address of 758 signatures, that I, and most, I share your disgust with, uh, that you expressed for treason and rebellion under the shape of the repeal ag agitation, and have no fear that you know, we will stand strong, essentially is the message in all this. Uh, so look, the parades kept going, but Robert Wilson, engineer, another very significant, how would it, what's the time? Oh, no. I'll give it a few more minutes. We're not going to get very far into the famine, but this is necessary. The, Robert Wilson was the engineer living in Ben Burb, who was doing a lot of the work for the Paris Court Estate. This is his map of Black Watertown from Prony. It's a very ornate map. Um, he, was, he was a young man of incredible talent. But he had a tough time during the... the, the so, you know, I, I can empathise to a greater extent than maybe some... You know, some you know, it's possible to empathise with some of the officials of the state more than you might think for some of the struggles they had to deal with during this time. Uh, look at Robert Wilson. For some reason, this shows you again, why was this happening? In November, so the famine's beginning to... The famine had spread around... I'm not going to give you all the details of what's happening nationally. The famine has begun to take, to, take hold of parts of Ireland in autumn of 1845. There wasn't mass deaths at that time particularly in the south and the west, were badly hit, but it wasn't huge starvation to the point of death at that stage. There were some deaths, of course, but it was really 1846 that began to kick in. But it was felt, the poor crops were definitely felt, the, the blight had spread to Ulster, but they thought maybe they'd be able to withstand it. But look at this, Robert Wilson living in Ben Burb, his a fake, a hoax report of his death being put in the national papers in November 1845, and it gives details that he was working on the, on the railway in the neighbourhood of Carrick Macross, County Monaghan, in discharge of his duties, and uh, that gives details, it talks about even 
he was how he was working. And Mr. Wilson was from Van Berg Tronas, left a young wife and, inter and with interest the widow and seven children. The times are awful. What is to happen next? And then another account to corroborate it, talking about the tools he was, the, specifically about the tools he was working with and how the murderous attack was done on this line of railway. And it's quite similar in detail, but sort of mixed up. But you know, what was why, why was this? Why were these folk stories being generated in the national press? Why would somebody go to such extraordinary detail? I can't give, I can't proffer a reason right now. But if you can think one, please do. But at the same time, here Robert Wilson, who was an, an important figure in the state locally. Uh, sorry, where is it? No, uh, sorry. I'll come back to a minute. Threatening letters, Mr. James Field of Curran. Uh, I'm not going to this, uh, detail, but. These are threatening letters they received in 1845. The, the threatening letters are increasing in frequency among different people. The police are reporting these. Uh, and look at this one here, D David Smith of Garvahi. And you can see how uh, this is over rows over land and stuff. And you can see there's an axe, there's a coffin, there's death or glory with a sword. Uh, by Shay Ford Boy had written this threat letter, threatening letter. Um, some of these letters have similar handwriting, but um, I haven't had a chance to bring them to an expert. Um, <laughs> But uh, it talks about how his, oh dear, this is bad. Uh, it makes some very unfair commentary about his, about his, about his wife. Uh, maybe, I hope you can't read it all, but she was a blaggard before you got her and so on. Uh, and she was a common flag walker and uh, something about, send, send, Dave, send David, I wish I could read this properly. Send David Wiley's ducks home. Send Michael Dugan's geese home. James Connolly's spade home. Uh, Something perjured uh, would swear white, I don't know. So that's what Shayford boy, some of what Shayford boy had to say for himself. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, sorry, that's in the wrong order. Where are we? What I was going to show you there was about Wilson, was that he ran the shop on the Paris Court Arms Hotel at this stage. And uh, there was significant looting of the shop in November 1845 reported. And um, there you are. Maybe that's why I can empathize with him. Uh, but, uh, the, um, but you can see whether this is, again, this, even though the famine has kicked in, the sectarian tents are still a big thing. And so the Lundy effigy was burned over here in the hotel, and for the first time that I know of, it was reported. And the New York Telegraph didn't spare any details. It was quite graphic in its descriptions of all these things uh, in December 1845. And the Henry Marshall names. Hey, this goes forward and back in the Armagh Guardian, the Ulster Gazette. Somebody denied, this didn't take place. And he said, no, it did take place. Not only did it take place, but Captain Cranfield, Thomas Eyre, and the Reverend Wrightson, Cure of Clanfacle, all were there and saw it. And uh, so uh, what was this about? Why were they burning Lundy at this time? The reason they were burning Lundy, it seems, was a message being sent to, was it Lord Northland, who had voted for the Maynooth Endowment Act that would enable Maynooth College to... Um, you know, educate priests and a couple of other things at that time, and he was perceived as being a Lundy, and this this was um, this was a way of sending a message to him. Uh, I suppose I'm saying this is you might you know ostensibly you might think that all this stopped when the famine was beginning to kick in, but it didn't just stop overnight. Um, um, and there's another there's the 12th of July 1846, uh, the details on how they went to Wilson's Paris Court Arms Hotel. Uh, and so on from different districts. Um, Walter Hoare by this stage is the agent of the estate having replaced Cranfield, but Cranfield was still based in the estate in Wicklow and had, a site, had oversight of this area. area. Um, look, I, I, I was through a couple of things and then conclude for tonight. The potato blight really was, has re had really begun to take hold uh, from the autumn of 18, from the summer, uh, late summer, autumn of 1846. And how do you see that manifesting on a local level? Uh, we'll look at this extraordinary report from, and oh, this was actually 1845, Loch Gall and Charlemont, showing the condition of the poor and the state of the potatoes in 61 townlands in the Paddy Sessions district of Loch Gall and Charlemont, carried out by Loch Gall Providence Society. I don't know if that was Quakers, was it? Um, uh, and it extraordinarily gives you the number of potatoes grown by each farmer in that land and the number of good potatoes and bad potatoes. So, for example, His Grace the Lord Primate, the Archbishop of Armagh, had 4,000 good potatoes and 6,923 bad potatoes. Uh, and then, you know, gives the smaller farmers. So down here, Mr. Cardwell had 2,525 2, 2, good ones and 805 bad ones. He fared quite better in proportionate terms. Uh, there's one man who had 16,545 good ones, but 15,225 bad ones. So 
it's fascinating on a local level to have that. It's quite a unique report, I would have thought, for an area like this. I'm not going to all the details now, obviously, but uh, that there, Baron Charlman, um, he was obviously in charge of that estate. Um, so he was actually quite an old man at that stage. Um, but um, he had actually, his, the only account that I can find of what was going on in the Danburg estate in 1845 in terms of the potato crop was from him. And this is fascinating because he had quite an air of confidence of what was going on around the Moy and on his own estate. But here's what he said. And in a, in a, was, this was just a postscript to a letter he was writing to somebody. So he said, I have not returned from an attendance at the Paddy Sessions in the town of Moy. I think it right uh, to, uh, has a, had I met there, Mr. Hoare, Walter Hoare, the agent of the Parish Court Estate, is an extremely intelligent young gentleman who has the care of Lord Parish Court's the Ben Burb Estate. The report of the state, his report of the state of things as to the malady is, I am sorry to say, discouraging indeed. Um, something, uh, something inspection of uh, the lamentable subject. I'm sorry I can't read that properly, but he's basically saying the potato crop is worse in Ban Burb area than it is around the Moy. Uh, now, uh, I'll, I'll do more. I'll do some more on these. Robert Peel was the Prime Minister at the start of the famine. I'll talk more about him the next time, but the, on a local level, how were they beginning to document things? I showed a bigger report, but they, the police actually started doing reports. This is from the National Archives. They started collecting data on the potatoes grown in the different unions areas around here. So for the example, uh, Dungannon uh, Parish of Clonfacal, now this is one part of it. This is the Ben Burb part. This is Constable William McGowan's report on the potatoes grown. So what extent of land was planted with potatoes in this parish, in the Ben Burb section, uh, in 1844? 1,094 acres in 1844, 1,096 acres in 1845. Uh, what uh, proportion of that land was planted with potatoes was Latin Conacre? 97 acres in 1844, 98 acres in 1845. Uh, so about 1,025 was acres were planted with potatoes. Uh, and the, the amount of con acre had been reduced by 1846 to 64, and there were also going flax and turnips. Now, you can see in some of the other reports, although it's not very clear here, how the reduction in the amount of was being grown was already evident by 1846, how many were being planted. So this is from uh, Constable in Caledon, um, and I, I look, I, it's, a bit, a bit of, it, it's gone down from an eighth of the land has been planted with potatoes to a seventh. Um, now this is from Blackwater Town. This is the party of Tyranny, so Tyranny. So I think this is probably going to cover Blackwater Town, maybe Glenall, what we now call Police Town. I think. So it's talking eighteen forty four. This is very uh, significantly hit six seven six acres. Then eighteen forty five six thirty eight, eighteen forty six five four five. So you can see, but year on year, that they're planting fewer potatoes, uh, and the, but more there's more con acre per year, which is actually different from most other areas. Uh, and talking about wheat, oats, and turnips also being planted. Um, so those are two examples. Now, just a couple of other things before I finish on examples of how the famine wasn't, it wasn't leaving the death space for starvation, but you can see manifestations of its effects in different ways. So this is a, this is a murder in April 1846, where the dead body of James Patterson was found uh, outside um, Ben Burb, and the inquest was held here. And they, they found, um, they found uh, the culprits, or they, they, found, they found culprits, and it, was, it seems to have been relatives. Was it his wife? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite sure the whole story. But sorry. He, a young man, he resided at Kin Garb near Gan, with his stepmother had been missing. And anyway, after his first wife's death, he married a widow named Loy. Yes, she was the culprit, alleged. And um, anyway, it turns out, is it in there? The report is that she had sought to uh, get enough money to emigrate, uh, to emigrate with her son due to the pressure in the land. So th they ended up murdering him, uh, and the body was found here. Other manifestations. Now I'm fascinated by this. Suddenly, in August 1846, July 1846, Derry Fubble Agricultural Debating Club. So they won't have debates about this. Now, you could say this is for the purpose of sharing information. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe it is what it says in the tin. I don't know if it is, though. So it talks about, they had a, they, this is said, he gave a tea meeting at Mr. Whittle's last week, which was respectively attended. 
Dr. Burton in the chair and talks about Mr. McCluskey, David Wiley, Jay Forker and Alexander Pinkerton having entertainment and this is going to be useful for them to discuss things regularly and it's going to be exclusively agricultural subjects. But I don't know, this, this, there were similar things other places but it just seems strange to me this is the time it manifests. Maybe it's not strange but the reason I'm suggesting this is because there are strange things going on around places like this. Uh, you say, well, did they ever, was it ever thus? But uh, <laughs> the... Uh, there's, sectar there's still sectarian affrays. There's John Miller, who was a local orange man in Drum Drum Drury Creevy in, in June or July of that, being chased by nine or ten men for, as far as Battleford Bridge, where he escaped unhurt. Uh, but here's what I'm talking about. August 1846. Now, this is probably not him. They're probably nothing to do with the Derry Fubble crew, but I'll come back to them in a moment. But look at August 1846. This is reported, in the, this is reported actually in an English newspaper and reported in a lot of the Irish newspapers. The Molly Maguires, the secret society... The secret society from, uh, like, you know, pe Catholic peasantry, uh, becoming very daring. At Ahatara, which is just in the Tully Moor area there, sort of, isn't it? Just beside the Blackwater River. Uh, uh, so, it gets it wrong. It says in the neighbourhood of Benbrook County, from us, in the Armagh side of the river, they had a, a military parade on Sunday the 2nd, when for three hours, and, and after firing many volleys, gave three cheers for O'Connell and repeal, and then they went to the house of a man called Crozier, and I suppose some were killed. Uh, now, this was then denied in the papers, but it's this whole question of what was going on in terms of peasant um, secret society activity, and was it really getting hold? You see these threatening letters, where were they coming from? I do believe that the Protestant consternation wasn't without some, you know, there was something going on, but unlike the Newry Telegraph, which was reporting blow by blow of these arms meetings, there was nobody reporting the reports from these secret society meetings of what was going on at them. But this is what was going on, uh, or sorry, a report is going on. Whether the truth, what the truth of it is, we never know. But but look at this: Walter Hoare, his property out here at Curran Loch, out towards on the Derry Fubble Road, and 26th of August. Some heartless ruffians came to Curran Lock and broke and destroyed a pleasure boat, the property of Walter Hoare, JP, Justice of the Peace, and destroyed nearly one route of excellent turf, the property of Constable <coughs> William McGowan. So some people, whoever they are, are getting bolder. They're, they're getting into malicious attacks on property. Uh, and now there's more threatening notices. And look at this for a threatening notice. And this appears to be cross-community. And I, I say I'm wondering, is this the Molly Maguires? Is this the Derry Fubber Agricultural <coughs> Debating Club? Is this a, are they joining forces? I don't know. But on the night of the fourth instant, the following notice was posted in several places in the Paris Court Estate. Take notice, seeing the blight on the potato crop has become so alarming, we think well to caution the occupying tenant, particularly those who may be called capitalists, and also those who have been in the habit of tendering their rents on an early period from sinister motives, not to let their motives of or large purses induce them to do so this season until there is an understanding between the representatives of Lord Paris Court and tenantry. We trust the lovers of humanity and agricultural interest will take notice if any person will be so low or truckling as to pull any of our circulars down. Brand us not with Molly Maguireism, but if you wish to mention us, you may use the following gilt characters, the lovers, lovers of humanity. <laughs> we confess we have got at the present time a good gentleman to deal with Mr. Hoare. Uh, signed on behalf of our supporters, Captain Fearnot. And Captain Fearnot was a common soubriquet of the Terry Alts and the White Boys further south from the late 18th century, secret societies. Uh, note, we hope our neighbouring estates will take patron or take notice. So, you know, I, like, it, it, where's this coming from? And it, it's, it's well written and the police take note, this is well written, this is, this is, there's some thought put into this. But clearly, Walter Hoare and the estate had been demanding rents and this had been getting people's backs up, so we can't afford to pay. The tension is now rising and this may be felt across the tenantry. And lo and behold, they haven't taken notice by October 1846. On Saturday night, the third instant, threatening notice were posted in Van Burb, one in Mr. Hoare's yard gate and one at the church. The following is a true copy. Notice, again, no Molly Maguires but friends of humanity. Whereas the notice was posted at several places in the district of Van Burb and the said notice was taken down to the bailiffs of the Van Burb estate, we now warn them if they interfere with this notice or their agent, Mr. Hoare, we will pay, a visit, pay them a visit shortly. NB, no rents this year, no meal to be taken out of this country. So the export of the meal and products was clearly an issue and they were beginning to voice this through secret letters because they didn't feel that they could say it out loud. Now I'm conscious of the time uh, and I, it's hardly a cliffhanger but I'm just, what time is it now? 
I think I should probably leave it there for now, unless, unless you want to go another five minutes or so, but I, I'll cover 1846 to 1850 the next night. Is that, is that fair enough? We'll leave it there. When we get into the real ravages of the famine, so what we'll deal with the next night is we'll deal with when that really bad winter of 1846-47, the establishment of the relief committees of, for the Moy and Ben Burb and other areas and Charlemagne Estate, and we'll deal with the issue of evictions beginning to take place in a big way, uh, and the issues of uh, the assisted emigration scheme that was launched in April 1849, where over 200 people from this estate were paid to leave and go to America, and also with some very thorny issues about how people were treated after that, and how the, the outworkings for some of the key actors in this period, because some of the key people in this whole period had, well, some of them didn't last long after the famine, and it was, well, some very poignant stories and some very difficult stories, but look, I'm sorry for having over-talked. I don't know if there's time for any questions, but, okay? but uh, thank you for your attention tonight anyway. Okay. <clears throat> what Donald has done tonight is he has prepared, he has, he has given you the run-in to... Uh, the situation which happened from basically 46 after uh, from the famine and he showed you that he has, he has outlined the confusion that existed not only in this particular estate, the Wingfield estate, but there was similar uh, situation in the Northland estate in Dungannon and also in the Charlemont estate in, in Moy. Now, having said that, it was, I think, one of the things that he has, he has outlined is the fact that um, there was a lot of confusion, and for example, um, the, there's, it was absolutely clear uh, that under the Roden administration, the uh, the estate here, the Wingfield estate, uh, did pursue an evangelical policy uh, in terms of schooling and everything else. Um, Cranfield, I think, lived for two years in the cottage down in. In the, in the castle here before he moved. Um, uh, he was a key figure in this. But one of the things that, <coughs> that I, I would point out is that, uh, uh, that at that particular time, uh, the, the mass house in the Moy, Gorestown, which some of you know, just the little mass house, uh, which is down on the top of the Gors at the Gorestown uh, on the edge of, that is within this estate. That's within the, Wing the Wingfield estate. And that was the um, that was the the mass house as they called it uh, for the Catholics in the area at that particular time. Um, the the when the lease was up at that particular time, uh, the uh, uh, the Wingfield Estate refused to renew that lease. Now that is where the second Earl of Charlemont actually stepped in and gave them the site, which is now uh, St John's Church in Moy, and. Uh, he actually, some of, uh, again, as the Newry reporter, I think, uh, mentions that at that time, uh, the Protestant landlords or gentry, uh, led by Lord Charleman, actually raised 800 pounds for the, the building of that church. I only just throw it in as, as it's, it's not, it's conflict right through, you know, at the time, but it's not all one-sided. Um, it was a period, too, which, which, an extraordinary period in Irish history, uh, which I think uh, Donald has outlined here, starting with the Act of Union in 18, where Ireland lost her, her, uh, uh, her parliament, and then we had Peel's uh, uh, reorganisation of the constabulary, which went on through that. But there were an awful lot of there were an awful lot of uh, which Donald has mentioned some of them now. So uh, incidents. There was incidents on the building of the of the of the canal. There was quite a few sectarian incidents in, involved with that too. So look, I'll not go on and on. This is a uh, this is a, a starter for the next talk, which Donald will outline uh, the famine period itself and the effects that it had on particularly the small tenants, or well, not so much tenants. The, the small people who sh share, who had maybe less than one acre in in this area 
which uh, at that particular time uh, the, um, there was a, a desire to reduce the population on these estates. Now, uh, I don't think we, we have, have we time for questions? I don't think so. So look, we'll leave it on till next night. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. I want to thank Donald and we'll give him a round of applause for, uh, he has put an awful lot of research into this. Um, there is a cup of tea at the bottom and you're very welcome to, to enjoy a, 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 a cup of tea and a bit of a chat. All right, thank you very much.